slow. OK, so this was my, uh, showed up on my Twitter feed a couple of weeks ago uh, from a W3C consortium, and it shows the, you know, unsurprising to you guys here, I'm sure, you know, the explosive growth of the web since 28 years ago already. So I was looking at this and reflected back on, drop the mic. So I reflected back on my, uh, yeah, my, my presence on this timeline. Uh, I remember that I deployed a web server back in 2003. I'm sure there were more than 50, by the way. Uh, and my first web application that actually did dynamic stuff was uh, in April 94. So I've been doing this a while. My name is Liam Crilly. I'm a product manager at Nginx. And as I looked at the, this timeline with Nginx in mind, uh, it kind of starts around here, 2001. So not quite as far back as curl goes, but uh, pretty far back. And 2001, uh, the, yeah, the web was going through explosive growth, continued explosive growth. And the, the, that original first gen infrastructure was struggling to keep up. And the idea for Nginx, which is a web server reverse proxy that can handle huge amounts of load and concurrent connections was the idea of uh, this guy, Igor Sisoyev. He was running as a SRE, you might call him these days, but not back in 2001. And he was looking after a site which was going through growth and it could not handle the, the load. And his approach was to take a new approach to solving, at the time, was known as the C10K problem. How to handle 10,000 concurrent connections on a single server, single hardware box. So he went out and did that, wrote some software, open sourced it in 2004, and went on and on to become a very popular web server and reverse proxy. Today, in fact, uh, the, earlier this year, it accelerated and uh, outgrew uh, Apache as being the number one web server on the internet as a whole. And just out of interest, uh, how many people know about Nginx? How many people use it in their organization? I think that represents that number pretty well. Uh, what you may be surprised to learn is that when we survey our open source community uh, and indeed our commercial customers, we find that 40% of them are actually running Nginx as an API gateway. It was never designed for this purpose explicitly, but hey, it's HTTP traffic uh, and it, yeah, it works pretty well on Nginx. So if you have a use case, you can use Nginx for it more often than not, and you'll find that lots of the API management vendors will use Nginx as their gateway of choice anyway, under the covers. So I'm going to talk about API gateways uh, in particular. Um, but just to level set as we kick off, I want to just differentiate and level set on API management versus API gateway. Because sometimes these two things are, uh, mean the same thing or they're used interchangeably. So API management is about setting policy. It's about defining you know, what needs to happen, what should be enforced. Uh, from a security point of view, be able to get visualize that stuff, get analytics on it, and of course provide documentation, develop a portal so people can find your APIs, consume your APIs. The gateway, its job is to actually run the traffic. Right? So it takes those policies and it enforces them. So it does the things like authentication and rate limiting uh, and routing requests to backends. And the, uh, the unsung hero of all this uh, is exception handling, a uh, super important use case that doesn't show up in a lot of data sheets. So before we look at how we deploy API gateways, I just want to level set on some essential functions for what you want an API gateway to do. And uh, at this point, usually somebody argues with me that there's you know, another five uh, essential functions, but eight fit on the slide, so we have eight. TLS termination, we want to handle HTTPS end-to-end -end or terminate it, up to you. Uh, client authentication, making sure the requests coming into our application environment, our API environment, are from genuine clients. And then fine-grained access control on those requests. Authorization, can an API request actually consume this API? Or indeed, can this API client actually consume this endpoint? Rate limiting, authentication. Load balancing is another, because you're probably going to have more than one thing deployed. So that comes part and parcel. And service discovery goes hand in hand with this. Like, what are the available backends for a particular API service? And if you really need to, if you have legacy needs, or if you just need to provide a stable interface between the client and the endpoint, you might just do some transformation, either of headers or, God forbid, also uh, bodies. 
So let's look at some deployment patterns for API gateways. And we'll start with a simple one of your edge, classic edge gateway. So if you've ever deployed a load balancer, or even maybe a reverse proxy, this looks kind of familiar. So we've got an API client, it makes a call, the API gateway sits in the middle, sends a request to the right place. And if we were to scale these APIs out, then of course we get some seamless load balancing as well. We'll send the request to the least loaded server. Everything works terrific. So let's imagine these polished, uh, beveled APIs are kind of monoliths, and we want to introduce some microservices to this. We might be taking some functionality away and building a microservice for that thing, or we might be building new services. That's great. We can do that. Now, everything is being handled by all those functions, those essential functions are being handled by our edge gateway, as you expect. Let's bring the microservices in, and now we can send requests to the microservices. Easy. At this point, we need to add one more important capability to our API gateway, and that is facade routing. So our existing, let's call it API A, now has a new capability, a new endpoint that's actually implemented as a microservice. We need to make sure the gateway exposes a nice, simple, holistic API to the client, but at the back end, it gets distributed. Facade routing does that. Again, not too big an ask. But what happens when we want API A to make a call to API D. Now, at this point, there's no rate limiting in place, no authentication. And if you want to do load balancing and write that logic into an, a monolithic API, then you probably uh, are in for some trouble. So it starts to become difficult at that point. So to introduce the two-tier gateway, we separate our concerns. We put a security layer out front. It's handling the TLS side, the client authentication, it's screening clients before they come into our application environment. And it can also do centralized logging and maybe even inject some tracing ID headers at the beginning so that we are distributed applications can get uh, good tracing information. In the center, we put our routing gateway. So it's doing the fine-grained authorization, can I access this endpoint? It's also going to do the service discovery and the load balancing. It's got a nice view of all of the services deployed, how many they are, where they are, and it knows how many requests are in flight at any one time. It can make a great load balancing decision in the center. This is a good, a good model. Uh, it fits very well with uh, cloud deployments or existing infrastructures whereby uh, you'll find lots of the functions on the left-hand side here uh, in your cloud load balancer you know, out of the... You know, available off the shelf, or you may have an existing edge load balancer in your data center, and you can do all these things at that point without introducing another hop in your overall application environment. And that's a good thing, because more hops are more latency. The other good thing about it is that the left-hand side becomes very stable. All it needs to know about is the API, and it should do some authentication for access to the API. It does not need an IT service desk ticket every time there's a new endpoint introduced. So if you've got DevOps teams making high-frequency updates, if you're owning an entire application and updating it and deploying it, you don't need to go back to the IT team who run this edge or run the cloud load balancer for you to have changes made. You can do that in the routing gateway, add the routes for the new endpoints you're creating. Uh, and it's a, it's a nice separation of concerns, and different teams can own different parts of the infrastructure. And that's great to a point. Uh, and the point that that starts to break down is when you've got multiple DevOps teams, each owning their own applications and wanting to publish and update their own APIs with their own policies. And they end up trying to do the same thing on the same piece of infrastructure, and that central routing gateway becomes an administrative bottleneck. And actually, you end up with the same sort of IT service desk hell as you were trying to avoid in the first place. So for that, and if you've got high frequency changes and you're doing uh, DevOps style processes, we can look at another model. The nice thing about this, of course, is that when A calls D, it does so going through the gateway. So it's got a full view, it can do authentication, it can do the fine-grained access control, uh, and it can do the load balancing. So DevOps style, we could look at a micro gateway pattern. And in this model, the DevOps team get to own their own little gateway. Now, this means they can update the gateways when they like. They can deploy as frequently as they like. They can have the authentication policy that suits their particular API. So you might have uh, an API that uh, services out to public clients. And for that, you might 
have something like uh, OAuth or JSON Web Token validation going on at that gateway. You might have a more of an internal facing API, uh, and that might have you know, maybe it's a legacy shared secret API key, or maybe it's uh, even better using client certificate authentication between services. You get to have each team pick their own authentication model. Um, although, in my experience, DevOps teams, that means you'll get uh, one, two, three different types of authentication schemes in your application environment. So. Uh, be careful with that one. So what's going on here is that we've got those kind of edge functions still sit outside. We've got TLS termination happening at the edge. Routing to each of the individual APIs is quite simple. And rate limiting can also happen as a security function. At the micro gateway, we're doing the load balancing between each of those instances of the application code. We've got the authentication per API. Works pretty well. And what works even better is we can now have service-to-service uh, -service calls. So for example, E calls F going through the gateway for F. And these individual application environments, perhaps run by different DevOps teams, maybe even different uh, pieces of the uh, infrastructure, uh, mean that there's maybe hopefully no network connectivity to allow uh, E to contact F directly. So we solve one of the earlier problems. And this brings up the point of east-west traffic. So. The APIs don't live alone. They live as part of a, an API ecosystem, if you like. And the more you move towards microservices-based applications and APIs, uh, the more things get distributed. And the more likely it is that one service relies on another service. It's just a function of their size. So let's look again at the, the micro gateway model. Uh, so we've got E calling F uh, going through the gateway of F. Brilliant. So some challenges start to appear in terms of where does the access control rules live, and how's the authentication happen? So application E now needs to either be hardwired, so, so hard-coded or configured with authentication credentials to access service F, or it needs to obtain them dynamically somehow, either by, uh, through a sort of token issuance or a certificate, uh, ephemeral certificates. So that's an additional workload that we need to put on the application code. But notice that when E calls F as if it were an external client, the micro gateway F needs to do everything else. TLS, rate limiting, service discovery, load balancing, authentication, maybe do some transformation as well. So when you have a micro gateway, it's, it's micro in terms of its name, but the functionality you need is as rich as you would need from a centralized or an edge API gateway. So beware of micro gateways that are micro in terms of feature set. So what becomes challenging is configuring how E can get to F and how authentication credentials get propagated. And the possible solution to that is to look at the sidecar gateway. So in this model, we have an API gateway co-located with every service. So when E calls F, it now does that by going out through the gateway of E and in through the gateway of F. And this is great because it offloads a number of challenges related to the application. So the application now long, no longer has to have authentication credentials or implement service discovery. That stuff can now be configured in the gateway. The application code is stable. It doesn't have to be changed. And you can move towards this kind of pattern without having to touch the application code itself. You simply need uh, a DNS name or something for uh, each of the services you want to access. But this highly distributed pattern uh, throws in some additional uh, challenges. So first of all, that service discovery and authentication credentials, they now need to be configured in the gateway. It's an easier problem to solve, but it still needs to be done. We have the edge layer doing all of our TLS, the client certificate authentication, so external requests are coming in and they're getting properly screened before they move into the application environment, all, all these sidecars. But notice that for an outbound call from E to F, we also need to make uh, a service discovery and load balancing decision. So we're calling F. There are three Fs to choose from. Great, we can pick one of those. Um, but what if service A, B, C, and D are all trying to call service F at the same time? Which one do they choose? How do we avoid them all deciding upon the same instance of F here as we've got on the diagram? So load balancing is 
how we've normally solved that, but load balancing usually is predicated on the fact that there's a central load balancer that knows about everything that's happening in the network. We've now distributed that. And so we need to do outbound load balancing, or, uh, which requires a different, a different approach altogether, uh, and one which is very, very difficult to do as well as you could when you have a single centralized view. So another uh, dependency that we're putting on the gateway is that it needs to do outbound load balancing as well as it does internal load balancing. The other thing that's difficult to solve is where do you put the configuration for whether E is allowed to talk to F? So there's that fine grained access control, either service to service or service to endpoint needs to be configured in the gateways. And not only that, but each of those gateways needs to be configured with it in a consistent way. Keeping all that stuff in sync and managing that through automated CI/CD processes is entirely possible, but it's also a difficult thing to get right and is quite prone to error. So into the service mesh. So it's another pattern for API gateways. It takes that micro gateway model, but instead of trying to manage each of those gateways in turn and by different DevOps teams individually doing their own thing with their own gateways in their own style, we now have our edge gateway Edge Gateway, which is uh, more than likely your ingress controller at the edge of your Kubernetes cluster. And then you've got a service mesh control plane. So it's responsible for configuring the gateway, so you don't do that directly anymore. And then all the DevOps teams use the same control plane so that they configure with what they want to do, who can talk to who, authentication is required, what access control is required. And it goes through one place, and the control plane is responsible for then applying those changes and that configuration across your entire application environment. Solves a lot of the distributed governance problems and introduces a huge amount of complexity in the control plane to get all that stuff right, to update everything at the right time, and to do so in a seamless way through a nice, convenient API or CLI toolchain available in the service mesh control plane. Uh, so it uh, promises a lot. Uh, today there's a lot of complexity, and we're not quite ready for prime time with this model. So let me take you back then to the nice, simple two-tier gateway. And look at that same use case of service E calling service F. E just needs to know where one gateway is. Any API call I want to make, talk to the, the routing gateway. It, and then the routing gateway knows all the services, all of their current state, all of the access control rules in one place. So unless you have high distributed uh, requirement for distributed governance across all these different teams, updating things at different times, solves a bunch of problems. However, uh, doing all that stuff in one place kind of looks like a bottleneck, right? Imagine we had a thousand services, microservices, not an unreasonable number, and that we had maybe 10 of those each in a scaled out environment. So that's 10,000 services talking to 10,000 other services. It's a lot of traffic, it looks like a bottleneck. But what if we consider those 10,000 clients actually as external, sort of internet clients? What if we had 10,000 clients trying to access 10,000 services behind one gateway? Well, Igor solved that problem well over 15 years ago on 15-year-old hardware, by the way. So in the reality is, unless you're at the scale of someone like a, a Netflix or an Uber, this two-tier model actually works pretty well a long way forward. And I won't talk through the pros and cons of each approach. You know, they each have their own, their own benefits. But I will mention that the, most, uh, the biggest deciding factor in when I see customers choosing what pattern to go with always comes down to security governance. Who's responsible for the security? And if it's one place, if you're in a high regulated industry, that is going to be a centralized thing. And distributing that out across uh, lots of teams become something which is almost impossible to manage. So if you don't have those constraints, distributed models look, work great. If you do have security governance requirements, like do you care about everyone having the same set of TLS ciphers, then centralized wins out. So with that, thanks, and I'll see you for Q&A after the next session.